Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Variety Hour. Um, we are delighted to be joined by four, possibly five speakers. Harry might join in, um, but we're covering a, as always, we're covering some conversations that are live in the community, sharing some projects that are emerging that people are working on um, or have launched in the community and um, inviting some big questions along and um, just really this is supposed to be your space to come along learn about conservation tech and just get a, a, a whirlwind tour of some cool stuff that's happening in in our sector so welcome we're so glad you could join us today this whole year we're going to be wanting running one of these once a month um, in between all of our tech tutors and other stuff that we've got going on and this year we've been uh, we're able to do so with the support of amazon web services so we're very very grateful that for that support our first speaker today is Josh, who is going to give us a quick, like, we've asked, so we've seen this chat in the community. Um, uh, uh, Isabel got this started um, just a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month or so ago, just when chat GPT was released, um, wondering if it had any applications with conservation. And so there was a lot of interest. And so we thought we'd throw it in as a conversational topic here to just see if there's interest in us having actually a longer, giving it a, the full spot later on in a future variety hour. So if you've got questions, drop them in the chat. But when we decided to, to bring this into to variety hour, that was before kind of all the things that happened in the last week or two with, um, with Bing and GPT being incorporated into different search engines. So it's suddenly become even more of a um, relevant issue right now. So we're really kind of interested to see what Josh has to say and to kind of see if there might be applications in conservation, if it's something we should be paying attention to, or if it's just going to be incorporated into our lives and we should just, all right, accept it, be done. We don't need to like pay that much attention. I don't know. These are all outstanding questions for me, but I'm interested to hear what Josh has to say and what you all think. So let us know. Um, stop share. Yeah. Josh, do you want to cool, thanks for the presentation, right? Yep, let me get that on my screen. Cool, everyone can see my screen, right? We can, we can. We maybe yes, we can. Nice. Yep. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, cool. Thanks for the intro. Uh, so I'll be cognizant of time. I know there's we only have seven minutes, so I'll try to get through this quick. Um, so in my day job, uh, we use GPT as an internal tool for productivity. So for example, for coding, uh, and we also do research in natural language processing, and we actually leverage large language models such as GPT for scaling market research. So we basically use it within our offering. Uh, market research is obviously quite different from conservation science, but maybe not entirely different. So there may be, there might be some opportunities to leverage models such as chat GPT in clever ways uh, that make use of their sophistication while not forgetting about their limitations. So in the next few minutes, I just want to kind of give an intro to how this might work. And then if people have lots of questions or ideas, then maybe from here, we could start a bigger conversation. So first of all, what is a foundation model? Because you might have heard this term as well. Foundation models are essentially really big models that demonstrate significant capacity for adaptation through in-context learning and fine-tuning. So although this doesn't really solve the long-tail distribution problem, since rare data still won't be sampled much in the training data, at least it means that for common patterns, few-shot learning is much more feasible, and so we can easily adapt foundation models to novel tasks. So for many applications in the future, a common approach might be to start with like a generalist foundation model, and then just specialize it or adapt it to whatever your task is by fine tuning it on your data. In a sense, there's nothing altogether new with foundation models. It's mostly just scale of model parameters and a huge, huge training regime. However, with that scale, it seems that we have un unlocked some sort of like emergent capabilities, which spring out of perhaps some sort of sophisticated world model that's latent within the way that we produce the data. So what is GPT? So don't worry too much about the diagram. I don't want to overcomplicate this. Um, just think about the three words, generative, pre-trained, transformers. Generative refers to how the model is trained. It uses a self-supervised learning approach where the model is given pieces of text and then asked to predict the next characters in the text, and it's penalized if it gets it wrong. Since the simple masking of the text requires no human annotation, it's a really effective way to learn patterns within language usage from completely unstructured data. The pre-trained basically just means that it has a huge training regime. So GPT-3, for example, was trained on hundreds of billions of words, most of which were scraped from the internet, and cost around $12 million to train. 
Transformers are the type of architecture that this model is based on, and they have been a key player. So there's an excellent article, if you want to look at the reference here, that can give you an, intu an intuition for why they work so well. But the 10 second version is that the attention given to each of the tokens in an input string is weighted conditionally during inference, so that the processing of the next predicted token is highly dependent on what is most relevant in context. If that means nothing to you, just kind of consider the fact that while this model is looking at the word it, it's it's taking into account it has a lot of attention given to a robot. So clearly there's sort of some comprehension that it is referring to a robot. Okay, so that's GPT. And then large language models is just a term to refer to sort of any large language model. So GPT is one type of language model. Um, and this term was quite popular. I'd say um, it's kind of being replaced a little bit by foundation models, which is a bit more uh, broad. Obviously large language models is more specific to text processing or voice processing. Okay, and as for chat GPT, you can imagine that if you start with a large language model like GPT as a base, and then further guide it based on human feedback, it would get even better. So that's exactly what OpenAI did here. They leverage reinforcement learning from human feedback. Basically, they have humans rank various model outputs for the same input. So that's what you see over here. Um, and from that, they learn a reward model, and then they use that reward model to further fine tune GPT. So that's why chat GPT can be so effectively and conversant, sorry, consistently conversant. Okay, so foundation models are available. They aren't cheap, but they are easy to use and they're very easy to adapt. So for example, the, the GPT models are offered as an API that you can pay to use. What does this mean for conservation, both in terms of GPT, but also more broadly in terms of foundation models? Uh, so here, I just have a few ideas, really the idea, the goal is to get people thinking, um, so to, to brainstorm things collectively and see what might happen. Um, but just to give a few examples, so people have already talked about chat GPT being used as a coding assistant. Um, I'd say that chat GPT and related models are extremely effective out of the box at this, and this is because they've been trained on huge amounts of code from GitHub and other sources. Um, you still need to be, you definitely need to be cognizant of its limitations. But as a seasoned programmer, I at least have found it extremely useful for rapid prototyping uh, and also really like for quickly picking up on new programming languages or for ones that I haven't used in a while. Uh, and I find that like treating it as a conversation rather than just like getting it to code something, but actually treating it as a conversation so that you can ask questions about why are you doing this uh, sort of does this does this code account for X and Y feature um, that that can be really effective. It's also been sort of uh, talked a lot about as a science assistant. So you may have seen that ChatGPT is being hailed as an effective assistant for writing papers. Personally, I found it also very useful as a sounding board for ideas, so you can bounce ideas back and forth. Uh, in some cases, ChatGPT has given suggestions on par with an expert professor that we work with. Uh, the suggestions were followed by confabulated names of models that don't really exist. So while you're having conversations with ChatGPT, Chat you need to like you might need to challenge it, or you need to know that it might be saying things that aren't necessarily bound to reality. Um, but with that caveat in mind, uh, it can be quite useful. And the idea that it came up with was actually really good. Um, besides this, natural language processing is already being widely applied for many other uh, applications within the sciences. So for example, accelerating literature reviews, I think that's something that it could be very effective at. Um, extracting structured information, for example, to create data sets, um, or analyzing trends, for example, in offset reporting or even in the news. Um, maybe I'll come back to the conversation assistant at the end. Uh, very quickly, I just want to mention some of the, the limitations. So there's sort of inherent limitations and more kind of data-driven limitations. So some of the, the more inherent ones are with types of reasoning. So for example, common sense reasoning or even uh, spatial reasoning because it doesn't have a spatial, it, it doesn't have spatial data. Um, also symbolic reasoning. So for example, with arithmetic, it can make basic errors. Um, it doesn't really have any skin in the game. And so what this means is that if you're relying on it for decision making, it doesn't really have any conception of the consequences of the decisions that you're making. Uh, there's also a huge issue related to interpretability and let's say trustworthiness. Um, it's in a sense not interpretable at all since it's such a large model. It, it'd be akin to looking inside a human brain. On the other hand, you can ask it for an explanation of why it's saying something and then it will give you an explanation in English. So at that point, I think it, it really becomes more of a question of why should we trust it? Uh, there's also some of the data-driven limitations depend of course on what data was used to train it. So typically it will have a lack of domain expertise for niche things. Um, there'll be a training freeze. So for example, it, it, it's expensive to retrain them. So 
Uh, GPT-3, for example, doesn't know what COVID is. Chat GPT doesn't know who won the Super Bowl last month. Uh, there's a lot of problems with implicit biases, legal and ethical concerns. That's a whole other conversation, so I won't go there. Um, and then I just want to quickly point out that ChatGPT is just one foundation model. There's lots of other foundation models, and they're not just for text. So I pointed out a few here. Uh, I'm not an expert in any of these, but there, some could be very promising and interesting. So for example, Ringmo um, is a recent one that was published, and it's purporting to be a foundation model for remote sensing. Climax is for from Microsoft, and it's for climate and weather modeling. Uh, AVES is from Earth Species, and it's for... Uh, animal acoustics or uh, animal vocalizations, uh, and there's plenty of others. So just in the to, to keep things within the time limit, I will quickly go back to this slide and just talk a bit about what might a conversation, sorry, conservation assistant look like. So this is something I've been thinking a little bit about, and I'd really like to hear sort of what the community thinks of this. Um, but I basically, one of, one of the big problems with ChatGPT is that it doesn't necessarily have a good sense of, like I said, domain expertise. So it, it's not a conservation expert. Nonetheless, it does have a very solid foundation for having conversations, for example, about conservation. So what's missing uh, potentially is some sort of add-on or interface where we could sort of uh, give it access to other types of information that could be fine tuning or it could be through other methods. Basically, if we could sort of force it to, to really focus on useful information that we know is available from, could be, for example, communities such as wild labs, it could be tech directories or other sort of literature related to conservation, then it could potentially learn from those things and then become potentially a really good assistant. So if you're a small organization that doesn't have access to a consultant, for example, maybe you could start with consulting some sort of AI-based conservation assistant and then build from there. So. Uh, I'll end on that. I'll just show a very quick example just for anyone that hasn't used ChatGPT. I'm um, an example of what it could look like. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not sure if I'm already over time. <laughs> I, I build a lot of buffer into these things, so don't worry. You'll be right. Okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll let people read through this a little bit. But basically what I did here was I simply asked ChatGPT to act as though you are a biodiversity conservation consultant. Um, I should mention the analogy that I usually use with ChatGPT is that it, like it's a really good actor. So if you kind of tell it to play a role, it will do a good job of playing that role. But you can imagine it's kind of similar to just asking some random person off the street, like, okay, pretend you're a biodiversity conservation consultant. So it's not going to have the, the level of expertise that a real expert would have. Um, but as you can see here, so I asked it about uh, setting up a camera trap based census for jaguars in a country where their population is relatively low. Um, with some other caveats. And basically, this is sort of the advice that it gave me on on where I should start and some of the considerations that I should make. Oh my God. Huh. So this is really interesting. I'm curious. I, I think the the uh, I, yeah, i'm I'm quite curious in the tech assistant sort of, and like also the the sort of comms space as well like i wonder if there's and it might just be because i sit in a position that's all about trying to get people to talk about what they're doing but i do wonder if there's a role to play for like helping do the heavy lift and then an, then you can go through and do an edit of like what trying to talk about your projects and, and like capture some of the the written the, capture some of what we're, we're doing and getting it written down and, and communicated because like ellie is in a different chat talking about how how it's already gutting like a lot of writing jobs and comms jobs i wonder in like cash strapped organizations and like when we never have enough people to do all the work if it could be helping in that way as well yeah i think definitely um so definitely like as a writing assistant i think mm -hmm. if you're using it effectively it can save you tons of time um so within our my organization we already use it for all sorts of marketing things um mm -hmm. and it's like don't trust anything that it comes up with, but understand that it's super helpful. It can save you a lot of time as long as you're then going in and actually reviewing and, and making sure that it's right. One of I the think things it also helps that like, it's easy. It's always easier to edit than to generate text yourself. So like if you, you, I, I kind of like use it as a starting point and then editing seems like much less of a, like, mental thing to do than like write a two page thing really? it's like edit what this gave you so it, like I use it kind of as a starting point to yeah. and then like edit yep. 
Okay. Yeah, and like okay. for sorry, oh, sorry. Josh, okay. final thought and I'm gonna wrap it up. Uh, yeah. Yes, I just wanted to add on to that. Uh, I guess it's also excellent like for grant applications. So if you just give it like a ton of context about what you want to do and then feed in the questions, then it can write grants for you. So I'll end on that. <laughs> Oh my god, will it? <laughs> That's great. Um, might change my life. Um, there's some there's some, a lot of chat happening in the chat about uh, like, you know, accuracy and and like Brett's got some really good points around um, you know, have models providing answers with confidence ranking um and and how it could help with that. So you might jump into the chat and pick up some of the comments there. Okay, I'm gonna move on to Andrea now, who's gonna talk about Move Apps, which is one of the winners of the Earth Ranger um, Conservation Tech Award at the end of last year. And also one of the, we're really excited to have you Andrea, because it's one of the, um, the projects that came up a lot during our tracking progress conversations and, and um, exploration, our horizon scan of the movement ecology space. Andrea, are you able to jump in now or should I come back to you? Uh, I think it'll be okay now. I have a sleeping uh, joiner here. I'm sorry about Side that. Sidekicks are always welcome. <laughs> so I will share my screen. Uh, if I can. Yep. You see it? We can. Um, let's see if I can get it all up. Yes. But I see too many of you guys here. <laughs> How can I get rid of this? Usually I have two screens. I didn't manage that today. Uh, I'm not sure. Because we can't Something see like that. Like, we can only see the screen. We can't see everyone's Ah, page. no, that's perfect. Then I don't yeah. care. OK, so thanks for inviting me to, to Wild Labs. I've meant to come already earlier, but yeah, this is the reason it never worked, because I'm sitting in Germany in the afternoon. Anyway, um, so I'm really happy to tell you a little bit about MoveApp, yes. which I would more introduce as a community platform for easy and open analysis of animal movement. The idea came uh, from Cameron Safi here, my supervisor at the Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior, because there is so much biologging and especially tracking data being collected recently. Um, and there is, on the other hand, people that are kind of experts in making analysis and methods and code. But we have to bring these guys together. And uh, since uh, Move Bank is already storing a lot of data that can then be used, um, we have thought we should also go ahead and um, make a platform where people can analyze these data in a, in a proper way. So that was the idea. And of course, oh, and how do I get on? Um, being the Max Planck Institute, of course, we wanted this platform to be a very special, super duper novel, and uh, also opening up science for everybody and making things reproducible. So MoveApps is working as such that anybody wants to, and I'm encouraging everybody here to try that out once, can contribute an app. A small R code or Python is uh, also supported since a few weeks that is doing something with tracking data that uh, you develop on GitHub and you submit to Move Apps as, as an app that people can then use there. Uh, all this code has to be open, so all related to open science, you select your, your license. Further on, when people then use your apps in a workflow, um, they, these workflows can be reproduced or these workflows can first be published. You get a DOI and then they're just available for everybody. You can reproduce them 100% as they are, which right now in science is still a little bit of a problem. And people can also get recognition in in a way for coding, which is also not kind of self-explanatory right now in science. Uh, MoveApps is a serverless cloud native system. So it's just working on the server. You don't have to have a super duper computer. You don't have to install anything. So you are just kind of independent of, of your resources, which makes it also rather inclusive and also sustainable and secure. So people, anybody can use it. and you can also just use it on your smartphone if you're in the middle of, I don't know, of the desert as long as you have internet, sorry. 
Um, one um, feature that has been used quite successfully in the past month, which was also one of the reasons, I guess, that we were uh, awarded the uh, Conservation Tech Award by Earth Ranger uh, last year, is its near real time feature. Um, so with Move Apps, it's possible to load data from Move Bank that are streaming in there, kind of real time or however you have programmed your tags then can run uh, analysis on these uh, data once a day, for example, and pass on the results. For example, we have an integration with EarthRanger, so it's passing on information that is calculated out of tracking data to EarthRanger that rangers in Africa right now are using to, to find the feeding spots of vultures, for example. Um, as a cautious remark, we are still in our beta phase, but we are about to end that, and there are already about 650 users, which is uh, kind of rather overwhelming sometimes, but I cannot see how much people are actually using it. If you want any more details on uh, on the system, you can have a look at, uh, at the paper that is cited down here. Um, most of the apps that are available for analyzing data, and I think that's what most people are interested in, um, were made by us, but we hope that this is uh, soon gonna change. There are now 66 functioning apps that you can kind of explore in our app browser um, that provide data access, filtering, some simple movement properties. You can have some visualization or annotations, which are still rather simple. We hope that people will soon pick up and and uh, contribute some, some more uh, tools there. There are some clustering, segmentation apps, and also some environmental integration as, for example, a road crossing that uh, one can detect from tracks, which I think is, is a rather important tool right now. Um, yeah, and I said, we have now six people that are developing apps, but uh, I hope there will be more soon. There's also public workflows that people have shared with everybody on the platform so that you can use them um, kind of anytime. And one feature that I find uh, really important and helpful and I wanted to point out here is that workflows, which are like apps stitched together that run a certain analysis can be shared with other users that on the platform that can then apply this workflow to their own data and to kind of run exactly the same analysis as you had done before. And as I said before, workflows can be published with a DOI so people can get back to them. And last but not least, you already said that Stephanie, um, last year we won the Conservation Tech Award from Earth Ranger, which was rather, let's say, intimidating for us because I had never expected but I think I realize now that it was that the committee had seen the potential of move apps and I think it has great potential because if the community is really going to to work on it and and join it anything is possible um we have got some money if for this award and uh, got some additional co-funding from uh, our university cluster on collective behavior. And uh, the plan is to make an app developer challenge and workshop with that, where we want to kind of encourage people to think of and develop some small, just doesn't have to be anything super complicated, but of course something super novel and creative uh, in terms of apps to equip move apps for conservation. Um, we have some use cases that we uh, ask people to kind of work on. One of them could be mortality, clustering, home ranges, or human wildlife interaction. We are right now in this phase of kind of thinking of how are we gonna do and how are we gonna set up things. But please, anybody watch out and join the coding challenge, which will start in May, March, April. And uh, maybe some of you uh, can then come to the workshop uh, after the summer. And uh, I'd be really happy to exchange ideas and uh, get more apps. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrea. So out it there. Would be, it would be awesome to have, like, we'll once you put the call out um, to pop it on Wild Labs and get it out to our community. And you're also That's welcome. the plan. 
welcome to pop along to another variety hour because we have a space at the end we might not have time today but we usually have a space at the end for people to jump in and like hey this is coming up you should come along so definitely um have uh, make use of that okay thanks thank you so much Andrew. that was awesome um if you guys have questions do you want to grab andrea in the chat and we're going to move on to harry and arby or actually arby. not you ellie <laughs> not yet one more <laughs> um, yeah do you want to jump in do you have do you have a presentation yeah cool. yeah uh Hi guys, uh, I'm gonna keep my uh, video turned off. I'm just gonna share my screen. My bandwidth is a little low. Okay. Uh, all right, one second. Okay, is this up? Yeah, it's perfect. Great photos, good start. Off you go. Okay. Cool. Uh, hi guys, uh, so I'm here with my colleague, uh, Hari, who's also here on the call. Uh, so we're working together with an NGO called Dakshin Foundation to work on uh, green turtles in the Lakshadweep archipelago. To, okay, so just to give a quick background, in the mid 2000s, we had, uh, sorry, let's see. yeah. yeah. Uh, in the mid 2000s, we found a very uh, big increase in green turtle abundance across the archipelagos, and that was, something very interesting and we wanted to study how, uh, why there is such a big increase and also what it means for, what it means with respect to the uh, resident uh, seagrass population. Uh, since the green turtles are uh, major foragers, we wanted to know how their foraging strategies differ between uh, places and how they're establishing new foraging sites uh, and moving between islands. So as you can see here, the island, it's a very small island group. You can barely see the islands at all in the first place. Uh, but the turtles do move a couple of hundred kilometers between the islands to find patches of green grass. So we wanted to find, uh, find out what's happening. Uh, so instead of buying uh, commercially available tags, we wanted to develop our own GPS tags for the sea turtles. One of the main reasons being that we wanted to deploy them in larger uh, num larger numbers. So we wanted to develop something that's very, very low cost. So we started developing our own tags. Uh, so yeah, so here's the tech part of it, so which is the development of the tags, which we're gonna like very quickly jump into. Uh, first thing was the hardware design. When we started developing the tags, we went with the classic route, which took, uh, took an AVR MCU, which is like an upgraded Arduino. And we slapped on a GPS unit and a flash to record all the data points. Uh, we took some uh, we took some peripherals, an accelerometer, temperature sensor, and a submersion sensor, and we added all of them and interfaced them with the microcontroller as well. And we also threw on a long range radio with a small monopole antenna. Uh, so the whole idea was that all of these create like the bare uh, bare uh, you know, essentials for a tag that can be used to track uh, sea turtles. Uh, so something very interesting that we, uh, I think, did uh, according to what we researched was most of the uh, most of the classic tags have something called a saltwater switch, uh, which is used for uh, detecting whether the tag is above the water or whether the tag is underwater. But we also found out that they use electrodes to like transmit like a small current. And since the seawater uh, is always conducting, that's how it detects whether submersion is occurring or not. So, but there are the electrodes are also uh, very prone to corrosion because of the salt water, and they also need to be in direct contact with the water. Uh, and there are there are quite a few failures as we have seen. So, to solve this, what we did was we uh, we used a multi-channel capacitive sensor. So, instead of using electrodes. Uh, as a method to transmit electricity through the water, we just sense the change change in capacitance between air and water, which is uh, which is quite distinctive. So uh, this kind of capacitive sensing, I'm sure many people must have heard about it. It's used in like it's used to detect water levels in uh, water tanks and uh, stuff. What this also means is that the capacitive sensing occurs through small electrodes that can be waterproof. 
because the electrodes can sense the change in uh, capacitance between water and air, even through something as thick as three to four millimeters of glass. Uh, for the purposes of the turtle tag, a single electrode is sufficient to sense whether the tag is above the surface or below the surface. But in our system, we can use up to 12 electrodes as a redundancy. Uh, so in case one electrode stops working, there are 11 more electrodes that can ideally like detect whether the tag is above or below the surface of the water. Uh, and the main reason we want to do this is because we want, uh, because since the GPS cannot pick up a signal underwater, we keep the GPS turned off by using the capacitive sensor as, uh, as a way to know uh, <clears throat> the position of the tag in the water. Uh, also moving on, so I think everybody knows what a LoRa radio is, I'm assuming, but for those of you who do not know, uh, LoRa is, a, is the latest generation of uh, radios, which is capable of very, very long uh, distance radio transmissions with uh, very low powers. Uh, it also has very high noise immunity and it can also transmit a lot of data. Uh, more than that, it is also capable of uh, mesh networking. So for us, the idea is that we want to set up base stations across the archipelago and as in when the turtles move the data, they create a mesh network where the data is automatically transmitted between the base stations and uh, collected at one single point. Another reason is the LoRa radio can operate in open license bands. Uh, so for us, it's H65 to H67 megahertz, which, uh, which means that Anybody can operate this without without having to get a ham radio license, etc. Uh, moving on, so this is something what we would we really wanted to share with you guys. So we put a lot of time and effort into designing the tag casing and how the tag uh, is supposed to look and uh, fit on the turtles. So this is uh, the the tag that you can see here is the version one casing. Uh, so this was modeled in-house on Fusion 360 and was 3D printed and uh, further infused with resin. So we also wanted to use something, uh, we wanted to use smooth surfaces and you know reduce, uh, uh, reduce notches and things like that so that the overall drag because of the water is less. Also, we found out that the shape also handles mechanical stress very, very well. Uh, I also want to quickly dive into how we did the fabrication itself. So we took the three, uh, we took the three D model and three D printed it with a shell of about ten percent infill. Uh, we purposely did a ten percent infill because we wanted to pour the resin inside the shell itself. So the shell is basically a resin, uh, resin with an outer coating of PLA plastic as well. Uh, and as you can see, uh, we have multiple layers in which the shell is made. So the shell contains a small battery compartment with uh, its own plastic casing and its own potting. But we have to leave our electronics in, in a small air pocket because the first versions of our electronics had a uh, uh, depth sensor, which works on barometric pressure as well. And we also have these small channels here uh, at the sides on which the small electrodes would fit. And the small hole is for the antenna. Uh, so these tags were about, uh, about four inches in length and about two inches in width and about an inch in height. Uh, but how the batteries, turned out proved to be very small for, for our purpose and the tags were actually dying much quicker than we expected. So for that reason, we uh, decided to upgrade our tags to a larger batteries. So this is our V2 casing, which is a lot less exciting to look at, but it, it looks a lot more classic. Uh, so we just have a larger battery, a diesel battery, and as you can see, we have some electrodes that attach to the side. In fact, we have six electrodes and inside we have the electronics with the GPS and uh, the casing itself. Uh, 
so all these also have uh, antenna ports etc etc it's the same mechanism they only change the design so that it can accommodate a larger battery Bobby, however sorry to yeah. interrupt where we're getting Are very we running out of time. yeah okay so, last slide i'm done lots of, lots of getting, you're getting lots of nice feedback but um i'm sorry <laughs> Okay, uh, all right. I'm just going to leave this on for like two seconds then. This is my okay. last slide. No worries. Oh, no, okay. talk, us through, talk uh, us through the conclusion, yeah. All right, uh, so, so far we've done the hardware and firmware integration. GPS functionality has been tested. Submersion sensors have been tested. But however, we've been having troubles with having the tags survive, uh, survive at 20, 30 meter depths in the ocean. So we would love any feedback from the community as well regarding uh the casing itself that's the reason i spoke so much about the casing uh so yeah um, any feedback would be very welcome okay Thank you guys. So you've got a couple of comments from from robin and brett um and i mean vance just thought it was cool so i mean in, i'm into it um so do you want to pick up those those comments and discussions in the chat but thank you very much that sure. was super interesting thank you so much Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ellie, got five minutes. All right. Hang okay. on. Here, here it comes. I cannot find, oh, share sounds. There we go. All right. I don't want to lose that air horn sound effect. That's vital to this. Share <laughs> and share. Okay. Hang on. It didn't start with the front side for some reason. Backwards. It's technical difficulties. What's happening? Why isn't it moving? Oh, my Guys, it knows that we're on a time crunch and it's broken. Hang on. Sorry. 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 Oh my God. The pressure. Gilberto, I hope you are you're you're actually within 15 minutes. You'll have the full 15 minutes. I mean, well, I, I will be I will be exactly under 15 minutes or Perfect. less. All right. Look, we don't have to go anywhere, so we're happy for this to go two hours, but I do like to try and keep a tightish ship. Not successful. <laughs> So should, guys, I, should I start or Stephanie? I mean, okay, right. We're going to go to Gilberto, and we will we'll circle back. <laughs> finish with the quiz. What a great way to end, right? Right. Okay, Jake, can you help Ellie troubleshoot? Gilberto, you're going to go. go. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. So first of all, it's my uh, enormous honor to be able to speak to this community which uh, thanks to Stephanie that I'm reaching. I mean, I'm not going to go. If you want to know more about me, I have a long life in the business of Earth observation. Just gilbertocamera.org will suffice. So uh, Stephanie asked me to talk about big Earth observation data analysis. So I'm going to assume uh, no previous knowledge, just in case that I know many of you know things about it, but just in case, let's start from scratch. So the basic uh, point here is the open data policy for Earth observation satellite data. And this has been a major change in my lifetime. Uh, I hope I will, um, thanks for having a very, very nice gender balance here, uh, gender imbalance in the good side, but I'm old enough to remember a time when one Landsat image cost uh, $500, $1,000, that was it. And now you can get all Landsat archive open. So you have an open data policy, which is quite recent, not within even a decade. And now the question has become to everyone, what can we do with such data? And again, the prevailing paradigm that has, let's say, settled in the community in nurse observation is following the new digital economy, which is basically having a number of big data services by companies or by public services, mostly companies, in a way to access this service at low cost and hopefully a massive use. Obviously, this is the kind case for, for maps applications, which are now, you know, people don't even remember the time that we had to open physically a physical map going in Europe and going to the wrong places, but that's a long story. So, uh, what are, where are we? We are in a certain mix of things. We are in the, let's say, big satellite data is a reality. Services that host data are becoming available. 
but they're not standard. And what I'm trying to do is kind of clarify this. And lots of people are trying to do whatever. We just talked about chat GPT and machine learning or applications for, for mobile data set. And uh, what's the deal here and why is it tough? The first point I used to say, it's the elephant in the room. And this is obviously for those of you, uh, the African savanna, you might wonder yourself, well, there is a savanna in Brazil. Why don't we have a megafauna in Brazil? And it's a good question. Yes, we had the megafauna in Brazil. It was wiped out uh, 30,000 years ago in the megafauna in Africa. And again, as you know, the fauna itself modifies the ecosystem. So there's certain peculiarities in the African savanna that you don't have in Brazilian savannas. When we call them all savannas, we actually undermine the ecological knowledge. So my point is local knowledge will be essential and it's not going away anytime soon. And one of the reasons is that we are observing the earth and giving names. A lot of the time we're giving names to things. And these names are polysemic. We give the same name to something, things which are completely different. Forest is a typical example. Savannah is another one. And lots in agriculture, you can go forever. And in our work in either conservation biology or land use change, which is my area, you give, start giving names and these names don't really uh, have a gen sense of generality. So what is the change? The change now is that for those in the know, and I would imagine anyone coming new to Earth observation, would now start learning Earth observation by using a tool like Google Earth Engine. So what is Google Earth Engine? Google Earth Engine is a tool which is lots of data, has a very simple, and I'm going to argue it's really simple to learn and it's worth the time, an application programming interface and a lot of things you can do with that application programming interface. You can, in this case, what's there? Not everything is there. The typical things which are there are the open ar archives from uh, satellite agencies. So that's uh, Sentinel uh, and Landsat, Sentinel from European Commission and Landsat from the United States. And there's MODIS from NASA. There's some vector data. You will not find a lot of data. We, there's some links to GBIF, but that's another story. Terrain and land cover and some weather data. Lots and lots and lots and lots of data. Okay. What can you do with this data? Whatever Google lets you do. And that's a little bit of the snack. In, in other words, the application programming interface of Google can allow you to do a lot of things like selecting a set of images that match a certain area or time or sensor. Uh, you can apply something, but you cannot do any everything because it, basically is limited to the functions that Google give you. I'm going to argue that if anyone coming new to Earth observation will do himself or herself or it's whoever self a favor by learning to use Google, but not stopping there. There's a lot that can be done, a lot of data that can be explored. This is uh, no prices for guessing. This is urbanization in China. No prices for guessing, this is deforestation in Brazil. And this is basically time-lapse of Landsat images. And this is uh, some, uh, in Peru and Peruvian Amazonia, some of the uh, evolution, natural meanders of the rivers. And you can do a lot. A lot of people are exploring data. For example, this is a paper that came early on uh, mapping tree height distributions in Sub-Saharan Africa using Landsat and 8. Basically, you can sense, uh, in this case, it's an application that uses one image per year, and then the, it does the distribution based on years and so on. Anything to do with time, that time is a problem. 
uh, can fit well within this model. And this is also uh, someone that actually went as far as the New York Times, uh, the global surface water uh, map, which is uh, actually if you want, if you work in Earth observation and you want a surface water mask, uh, this is a, the one to go, the PECO one. So very interesting, nice to do. Doesn't solve all the problems though, because a lot of things that we do on land change and conservation, and it has to do with the temporal evolution of your data. You have a series of satellite images. Each pixel of that image is associated with one uh, time series. And in Google, it's very hard to do actual time series analysis. You actually analyze images one by one, or typically, for example, you get one best image per year. And at that moment, in environments which have a marked dry and wet season, anything tropical, for example, you get a mess because you mix the seasons. And any kind of seasonality analysis is, is sort of lost. And uh, for example, it becomes very difficult, just to give you one example close to my heart, is to distinguish between a natural savanna and a pasture. From a biodiversity point of view, there's huge distinction. This is native species versus basically invasive species imported from Africa, Brachiaria. But from the satellite point of view, if you don't have uh, and there's significant differences between those, not in a single image, but in a time series because of the differences in the adaptation of the native vegetation and the low adaptation of the grass uh, between the dry and wet season. Uh, the result of this is there's a product that some of you may be tempted to use, for example, to do biodiversity analysis at a large scale. For example, this is the ESA world cover done with Sentinel data. And this is a place on the Brazilian Cerrado and the yellow, no prices forget, this yellow is grasslands. And the second one is the same area we don't for the entire Cerrado in Brazil with my team, where we separate the man-made pasture, the grasses, the not native grasses with the native savanna, and then look at the difference. So what the like, Blue, uh, greenish, light greenish color, this is actually the natural vegetation. The sort of yellowish color is the pasture. And it's completely different in ecosystem. The, cons the conclusions you're going to take are completely different. For this reason, for example, I am currently working with a planetary computer, which is Microsoft. Uh, the planetary computer, what does it's much in a certain sense it's it's the sky is the limit but you're the limit in planetary computer you get the machine for example an r machine or python machine with eight cores for free you register you get a machine you get similar sort of data that you're going to use in uh in, in google and you can select images. I was looking for the uh, the mining, illegal mining, which is causing a major disruption and terrible humanitarian disaster in Brazil. If you heard the news and uh, with the Yanomami tribe, but but you're on your own. Okay. In other words, you, if you are an R user and we've developed packages. So if you are comfortable with writing your own code and, and using other code in R, then you're in safe hands using the Microsoft planetary computing. Because here, for example, this is our software, which emulates Google Earth Engine, but does more than Google Earth Engine. Uh, the first speaker talked about uh, attention, for example. So this, for example, is a classification, just a small example of classification of deforestation using something uh, in the jargon called uh, lightweight temporal attention model. You don't have that in Google and it's better than the random forest model that's in Google. So we actually are working on classification of deforestation and land use in Amazonia 
using this kind of model. That can be done with Microsoft Planetary Computer. That cannot be done with Google. So this is like, in a nutshell, the difference. If you are starting from scratch, and again, you have to remember the simple rule here. And I'm going just to put this slide at my final slide. So actually, it took 10 minutes, Stephanie, better than you asked. No, no, I, I, I could talk for two hours, but I think on the benefit of the time, it's easier to pass a clean message. You have to understand that you, an ecologist, a biodiversity conservation person, needs, need to really believe in yourself. The use of ChatGPT, the problem is language is its own meta language. In other words, human natural language is its own. You describe natural language in natural language. Whereas when you are in Earth observation, you describe the world in words, but the world that you measure in satellite data is not words. There's a huge difference between large language models for language and large language models for remote sensing. And I'm going to argue the world is uh, in, in language models, you have a lot of things that are being written. My daughter is, has a PhD in philosophy and she asked ChatGPT a question about Plato. And the response was almost perfect. Why? Because we have 3,000 years of people writing about Plato. And most of the writing about Plato that goes into Wikipedia or in, in ChatGPT is good writing. So what comes out is good. Now, of course, you would not expect the same kind of thing about Donald Trump or Jair Bolsonaro, for that matter. So words make a difference. You, an ecologist, if you want to start the game, the first thing, if you know nothing about anything, Earth observation, learn Google Earth Engine. Start with the basics. Then when you have mastered it, you will find out that it cannot do everything you need. Then you move to Microsoft and hopefully can use some of the packages that are available. If you are an R person, you're going to be happy because there are lots of things in R, including our package and many others. And on the slides, there are pointers to it. So, Stephanie, thanks again for having me. It was wonderful. And I said, I'm a discipline. Old people are disciplined, you know? You are. Thank you oh, it's the same to everyone else. Look, I, I'm glad you tolerated <laughs> our chaos. That was wonderful. Like, that so ex exceeded my expectation. What if we gave you two hours? What would you talk about? Well, we would discuss essentially some of the issues of uh, what happens in the concepts that we design an ecosystem. There's a very nice paper by Robin Shadson, uh -huh. which is uh, which is called "When Is a Forest a Forest?" Beautiful paper. I think it was either ecological modeling or some. Uh, and it's a beautiful read it. Okay. And, and, and it's a very nice, uh, nice paper, uh, which because it essentially tells you that some of our concepts that we assign to ecosystems are derived from observations, go there, see, or look at uh, remote sensing data, but are implicitly derived from the temporal behavior in either on a short scale, one year, or if you're into the game, into a longer time scale, centuries or thousands of years. A lot of what we tag the world is assigned to temporal knowledge. And that gets lost if you just see one remote sensing image or if you go to the field only once. Okay. You might wanna jump into the chat because there are a lot of comments and applause and, and just, I think we've got a little fan club that's formed and oh, uh, come on. <laughs> I, I think uh, that was wonderful. Um, and we may have you back for two hours. I would happily listen to you explain complicated things very simply to me. 
forever. Um, so thank you so much for joining and thank you to all of our speakers. We are on the hour, but we are going to run our quiz. So you're all forgiven. Uh, oh, and there are actually, Gilberto, there are a couple of questions. I know Sammy had a question about um, whether it's suitable for marine applications. And there are other people that were saying that um, uh, what you just showed was exactly what they were looking for. So like a, a, a lot of appreciation. Um, but so everyone, thank you so much for joining us, but we are going to run the quiz. If you need to run, that's, you're very, very okay to do so. But Ellie, Ellie promises us this is brilliant and I trust you. I have Ellie. a really good one. If anybody has to leave, look, I understand and you are formally forgiven, but I will be a little upset. Uh, here we go. <laughs> Ellie will remember. remember. I will remember. I will take notes on who leaves and who stays uh okay hopefully this works this time here we go share first yeah. we have a very exciting wild labs ad break we have the voice of wild labs jake is going to give us a wild labs ad break take it away jake great so yes at wild labs we're all about helping you learn something new about conservation tech so we'd like to just take a moment to tell you about our latest offerings uh, and this includes that now available for download on Wild Labs is an introduction to satellite technologies for tracking wildlife. Uh, this new best practices guide from ZSL was created with the support of Wild Labs and the UK Space Agency. So it's perfect for those of you who are new to satellite technology. You'll find everything you wanted to know about the applications for tracking wildlife, the different habitats they can be used in, and any research questions that they've been used to answer so far. So if you're curious about tracking wildlife with the latest and most effective satellite technologies, download this guide now, uh, and it should be on Wild Labs. And there may be a link in the chat for you to download that as well. Um, and next, if you're looking for interactive events to help you learn more about the conservation technology while talking to experts and connecting with our community, there is the return of our very popular Tech Tutors series. Uh, this is our fourth season called Tech Tutors East Africa, which bring together expert speakers who will cover tools and topics that help address conservation challenges unique to East Africa. So we'll be opening up new tech skills for our global community, wherever you are in the world. Uh, we'll hope you join us. Catch Tech Tutors online now through May and visit Wild Labs for any more information just for registering any upcoming episodes. Uh, but now it's time for Ellie's Wild Labs game time. All right, everybody, welcome to Wild Labs game time. Uh, we're not on a time crunch anymore because this is officially the after hours party now but we are gonna groove through these pretty quickly. Uh, this week's game is Tech for Wildlife Picks. And what that means is I'm gonna show you a pixelated version of something from our Tech for Wildlife photo wall. You will have 10 seconds to guess, and then you'll see the next pixelated one. And, uh, and then it'll be revealed. So type your answers in the chat, whatever you think this is, Steph or Jake, both of you maybe, if you would oh, like. To be exciting. <laughs> Jake, who, who, who wants to be who? Chris who wants to be my lovely assistant? assistant? Oh, I'll be the assistant. All right. Okay, we're hearing. You, Steph. Steph, you oh. can't participate. That's cheating. Oh. I don't. I'm so Steph, kidding. you're reading the you you were reading the the answers from the chat. Okay, so this one you've had a long time to look at, but we're starting the watch. All right, go. What does what everyone think this is? Koala, <laughs> Lima, chimp, chimp train, chimp, wild monkey. Uh, Dan just thinks it's a great idea. Uh, Getting a little clearer. What do we think this is? Oh, that is definitely a chimp. Come on. Yeah. Okay. It's a chimp. That one was pretty simple. <laughs> Next. Oh, here's the, uh, here's the credit for who posted that. Um, and again, you can see all of these in our tech for wildlife photo wall. All right, what do we think this okay. is? All right, what do we reckon? Giraffe from Carly. Giraffe from Jake. Croc from Robin. Right. What about this? Scenic desert landscape from Dan. Saiga from Cat. Lion 
from Nora Florencia, Carly Warthog, Lion, Lion. Mm -hmm. A little clearer here. Some of these have yes. three pixelated ones. <laughs> leopard from Cat, Leopard from Courtney. It's a leopard. You guys got it. Very good. All right. I think this one's really easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's squirrel from Carly. Yeah, Carly, that's your pose. Don't. <laughs> okay, actually, I didn't know it was mine. I thought it was yours from your squirrel. Okay, Carly, <laughs> Carly it's, it's your pose. It's your squirrel. Good job. That was a great squirrel photo. Huh? Okay, this one I think is also really easy. <laughs> Dan, what are you, Dan, Dan's complaining he doesn't, he doesn't understand how um, good everyone is at this. Um, no, no hint of a cat or a monkey. Really? Uh, elephants, 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 hippo from cat. Elephants. Bison. Elephants. Bison from Mitt, Brett. That was a good guess. Dan agrees it, it, it's an elephant. All right. Here well, I want to see what the project, wait, what, what project was oh. that? Yes. Oh. Cool. Hey, that's CUNY, City University of New York. <laughs> 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 All right, carry Shout on. Out, Carly. All right, here we go. What do we think this is? Triceratops. Quality from Dan. Sloth from Brett. Jaguar from Gilberto. <laughs> Anything else? Any other guesses? I think we, need, we need the next picture. Uh, armadillo. Um, triceratops smoking a cigar. Deer? I do like that. That would be an exciting thing to catch on a camera trap. 100% bighorn sheep. Correct, Carly. Yeah. Um, Oryx from Eaton. Oryx would be a... a um... Oh, nice. Uh, Oryx would be a, a nice catch. She's and I think this is the final one, and it's in black and white, which I think maybe makes it a little harder. I I, I would like to guess. Raccoon, yes. raccoon, fox. Yeah. So, ah, raccoon. <laughs> you guys know me too well. You know the animals that I'll pick. I didn't, say, I didn't say raccoon. That's what everyone was guessing. Oh, okay. Well, it is indeed my own raccoon cam. Uh, Carly, you were right. I did sneak in my own creatures, but I thought putting in my own squirrels would be too obvious. Uh, and that is Tech for Wildlife Picks. If you would like to see those projects and many more, you can visit our full Tech for Wildlife feed here. And now, this was originally when the show was going to be continuing back to the show, but back to the after party instead. Thank you. <laughs> um let's formally wrap up this this event um so we can have it for the recording thank you everyone for um for for joining us today and as always you're welcome to hang out for like the next little while we usually um stop the recording and just have a chat amongst ourselves um if you have to head off totally fine but you're welcome to to stay and, and hang out with us so uh to conclude thank you everyone and we'll see you one month from now